Welcome to Next Future Today, hosted by Dan Keldson, co-founder of PlexiCam.com. Find more episodes at nextfuturetoday.com, on YouTube, or in your favorite podcast app. This is Season 1, Episode 7, and the topic is Ditch Mediocrity. I had a wonderful chat with my guest, Helene Smuts, the founder of Credo Growth, a people development consultancy out of South Africa. In 2021, she published her first book, Ditch Mediocrity, to empower leaders to develop their own teams rapidly. If you've been listening to previous Next Future Today episodes, this idea fits fantastically with the key concept of Next Future Today. It's not just gaining knowledge, but taking action, quickly, that's the key to empowering yourself as well as your team. The sooner you start chipping away at making change happen, the sooner you'll see the results. Helene is also an advanced coach, a personality profiler, an expert in behavioral psychology, the holder of an honors degree in industrial psychology and a captivating keynote speaker. Find out more about her company at contract-sa.co.za. I was introduced to Helene by Richard Mulholland, who I interviewed a few episodes back about his book Here Be Dragons, which is similarly practical and insightful to Helene's book. There's something in the air in South Africa with Richard and Helene, and whatever it is, it's working. All right, let's dive on into it. Let's get started. So I, um, I, I'm sort of notorious for liking to laugh during interviews. So why not start it off with the laugh? So I'm talking today with Helene Smuts from uh, South Africa, and uh, where the temperature is rather dramatically different than what I'm currently experiencing in Boston, Massachusetts. But you know, such is life. Uh, but uh, Helene, thank you for for being on here. I think we were introduced by Rich Mulholland, who I interviewed okay, recently. Yes. He's yeah. also in South Africa, and how a yeah. house of human being. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a blast. Um, a, as of this recording, I haven't published that interview yet. But um, as as a musician myself, and he was touring as a roadie, we'd have a lot of things in common beyond that. That was yeah. quite a lot of fun. And, and in general, the reason for me to do these interviews is to find smart people who are also open and sharing uh, and not, not kind of very stoic and, uh, and just have a real conversation in this case about high performance and high performance teams. Does that, does that work for you? Yeah, hundred percent. Thanks for having Fantastic. Me. Yeah. So, uh, and this, uh, well, aside from aside from Rich, uh, this will be the second international interview that I've done in, in quite a while. So, thank you for helping to up the count there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said earlier, you, you're about to drink a coffee, I'm about to drink a glass of wine. So just in terms of the time zones as well, that, that it's not always possible for people to engage. So yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. There you go. And if maybe if you're Irish, you could have an Irish coffee and then you mix the, the best of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> or honorarily. <laughs> so um, I don't have a physical copy of your book, but I do have the electronic copy. Uh, yeah, do you have one? Hey, there you go. <laughs> it just feels more real when you hold it up. Um, but so part of, uh, so as I mentioned to you before we started recording, part of the reason I like interviewing other authors is I know it's, it's hard <laughs> to write a book. I mean, you could love, like I, I love writing and research, but it is a slog no matter how you slice it and um i don't know if you're on a deadline but for for me and my my co-author we had a three-month deadline which i didn't realize at the time was supposed to be impossible <laughs> and that's uh and knowing that now i don't know if that makes me feel good or bad because now what happens is if i if and when i write the second book <laughs> like that shouldn't have been possible but um what, what i like I is say when you write the second book not necessarily if it's more yes. like when you write the second book. i know yeah i'm trying to throw it out there but not throw it out there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh but what i like for your book what i really like is so i like um part of the part of what i'm doing with this podcast i want pragmatic advice i want yeah. as much sort of baseline foundational material that people can at least have some idea what we're talking about um and then you know but really help make it apply to them so i like books like yours that are it's far better than average uh design wise like it, it feels like sort of like a crafted book like the 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 fake coffee stains or maybe they're wine stains i don't know what you're intending <laughs> But, you know, it's, it doesn't take itself too seriously, except it's a serious topic and it's it's relatively short, which, you know, some people think, you know, like, I don't know if you've read um, Surveillance Democracy, but it's it's a huge book. I 
I have not read that yet. It's too bad. <laughs> I just, <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. it's it's like the it's nine times the size of your book, probably. And I don't think it needs to be <laughs> that long. So small, you know, why not get small bursts of content that can be applied? That's very pragmatic. And why not have some fun with it? You can, there's like some sidebar, so you know, sort of written in notes, um, which I love that kind of stuff. That's, uh, you know, I, I explicitly sort of think in parentheses and dot, dot, dot <laughs> when, when I'm writing or speaking. So I, I really like that. And what I like about that is, as much as I used to, I used to like Hoover up. I used to suck up four or five books a week, uh, partly because I could, I would walk to the train. I'd be on the train. I'd walk from the train to the office. That was all reading time for me. I don't know how I didn't get run over by a bus, but uh, <laughs> I, I read a lot. I don't, I don't have that kind of commute anymore for reasons you, you might guess. <laughs> and uh, I just don't have that time anymore. I suppose I could make it, but it's, that it was a, it wasn't really a time commitment because it was just something that I did while I was commuting. Now I'm not commuting, so I, I could be working right instead. But I like that you've done the research. A lot of it stretching back to, to guys from the 50s and 60s, which I think is always fascinating, which I definitely want to talk about. Um, so how did, how did you go about your approach to doing the research that led to the book? Is this, was this book like always in you and this was just, I just got to get it out and do it? Or did, how much research did you have to do on top of what you already did for work? So I think, um, first of all, there was, uh, luckily, I didn't have a deadline for this book. Um, okay. So <laughs> it, it, it's also, that's probably why it took a little while. Um, but the, the research has come from my 15 years of experience of working with teams in team developments and leadership development. So as, as I started working with clients, I started using different tools and different things that will fit that specific team in order to support them to go from where they are perhaps potentially storming or where they really there's really massive dynamics at play. Yep. So it's it's all the experience that I've learned over the few years over the 15 years that I've then said what are my top favorite tools that I use in a team development. By no means are these the only tools. I think there's 12 specific tools in this in this book. Yep. And that's how it came about in terms of what is the, the natural journey that I sometimes work, work, ooh, walk with teams <laughs> that I know work as well, Freudian slip, that yeah. I know work as well. And so that's kind of where, so the research has been done over the past 15 years, but I never knew that I was going to write a book. <laughs> okay. It has, it has never been part of my bucket list. Um, the, the way that it came about is I, I created an online course. And from that online course, I and a few, I had a mentor and my husband, and they challenged me and they were like, why are you not putting this in writing? Why aren't you producing something other than just an online course? And that kind of, that kind of sparked the whole process. I am not analytical. I think I mentioned that in the book, it's like I despise <laughs> academical stuff and theories okay. and things. Yeah. So, so the writing of the book was, it was so hard. Because, you know that you you can't just write and claim stuff as your own because it's not first of all it comes right. like you mentioned it comes from thought leaders from back in the 50s and the 60s as well so it was really a, a that was a big learning journey for me also in terms of to create to have patience mm. to write and to do it in such a way that actually lands well for someone who's reading and not sitting in a room with you sure yep and then the the biggest area for for frustration was the the editing part of it because mm. now you, i've written it and now i've asked a, a um, professional editor to help me because i'm my first language is afrikaans which oh. is one of the languages in south africa english yeah. i only learned how to speak english when i moved to cape town about 20 years ago so i don't write well in english okay. so she, she had to help me just in terms of the grammar and things and then of course i have to read it again <laughs> but I've just written this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear so, you. And then, of course, as someone edits the grammar um, and changes the sentence and things, it loses the, the meaning of what you meant. And then you have to change it again. So that was quite an interesting learning journey. In terms yeah. Of but I, I, and my, sorry, my husband has been a big help also, just in terms of like giving me confidence and saying that I'm on the right track. 
but it, it, it was it, it was an amazing journey. But it's it's something that came, I guess, because two people challenged me. Okay. <laughs> right. And and I can't let a challenge go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, so my uh, my current business partner, uh, who I've known since 1994, we uh, we wrote our book together back in 2014. And uh, the initial pitch from him was, "Hey, do you want to write a book?" And I thought he was like, "Do I personally want to write a book by myself? Because sometimes I'm dense. Maybe I didn't have my coffee by the time he, he contacted me that day." And I said, "Well, no. It's I'd love to write a book, except it seems like it's a lot of work and that." And, and you know, I know lots of authors. Like, at that point, he had written nine books. I was like, everybody who's written books has told me it's the it's the worst paying job you'll ever had. You know, once it's done, then it pays. But the process itself, you know, it's it can be it can be brutal. I was like, why? I, I don't think I can do that by myself. He said, "Okay, would you like to co-write a book?" And I was like, "Oh, I'm an idiot." <laughs> <laughs> And, and thankfully, his uh, because he, he was so experienced and we've known each other so long, it was very easy to work together, which is also pretty rare. So if, if you if you don't have, which I think ties to high performance teams, uh, if you don't have sort of compatible, you know, we're very similar, but we're not exactly the same. So we have different perspectives on things. We both like talking about the future. I like to make sure we can apply it to things that are happening right now and not just five, 10 years down the line. So for, for me, I was like, oh, okay, that I can handle because I know that you'll help me here and you've done this a lot and you can tell me something stupid <laughs> and I won't take offense at it because I don't know when it's stupid. I, I'd like to write, I like to do research, but sometimes it's, you know, it ain't good. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, um, it's definitely not the easiest thing that I've done in my life. I'll, I'll put it. <laughs> Dramatic understatement. <laughs> So let's let's talk about uh, so some of the guys from the fifties and sixties. So it's um, I think it's fascinating. So you know I think sometimes there's a danger. There are people that um, you know, I mean this just like anything. There's a lot of bad books out there. There's a lot of bad theories. There's a lot of stuff that's totally made up. I mean everything's made up at some point, but then hopefully verified over time, or it's you know it just it's a whim. Um, any thoughts on uh, there's there's so many sort of special areas that I've stumbled onto that for some reason seem to have started back in the fifties and sixties, mm -hmm. but there's so many people that don't know about it, even though it's been there essentially forever. I know you know in the history of the world, no, but you know as far as modern times go, why the heck don't we know this stuff already? <laughs> and, and you know, like how how did you stumble onto this? Yeah, so. <laughs> And I guess that's why I wanted to tap into those theories because people are, or people generally go for the new trendiest tool out there. Um, I did a keynote the other day, in fact, in Kenya and then Tanzania, where it was like, it's all these leadership um, theories that come up. It's transformational leadership, then it's servant leadership, and then it's daring leadership versus armored leadership. And it, just, it keeps on coming and coming, and every single time there's a new tool, you just need to kind of jump and be that kind of leader. It's freaking exhausting. Right. right. <laughs> um, don't get me wrong. I use those tools. They're amazing. Right. But I, I wanted to bring to leaders something that has been trial and tested that I know from a practical perspective works beautifully. And I think because of this need to be on trend and do the latest thing and be the latest type of leader, that's why those theories have been forgotten. Mm. Um, and the, the other thing, this is purely my assumption, is that because the theories are so old, people have forgotten that they can be extremely practical. Sorry. And that's what I try to do with this book is take those theories and turn it into something that you can implement physically in your team, not in a week's time, not over a period of a quarter. You can physically start tomorrow with most of these things that that's in the book. Right. Um, if you have the time, of course. Right. So, so that, that's kind of the, what, what the idea was as to how to use those theories that are so incredibly useful but not just leave them in a textbook, turn them into a practical application. Right. I always say knowledge isn't power, action is. So that's yes. kind of like where, where, where I'm coming from. Right. And then I, I stumbled, uh, the theory that pops up a lot here is transactional analysis from Eric Byrne. Mm. And I stumbled across that in, I think it was 2008. Okay. Um, and I got obsessed. 
I was a shareholder in a previous business and that was also the foundation of the work there and I learned it from my shareholders in Germany when I like it was a business that I was a part of for 11 years so it, it really formed the type of person that I that I am and the the fundamental theory that I so believe in it's not the only theory that I believe in because we use look again servant leadership transformational <laughs> leadership situational leadership all those things right. but it certainly forms the foundation of how I am being with people or trying okay. to be with people so yeah that's that's why it comes up and because I use it so often and it's such a practical way of doing things okay so, yeah. yeah so I definitely um so, you know, so I, I read your book. I am definitely a, a fan of high performance teams. I, I don't have the background that you, that you have. Um, and I've, I've heard a teeny tiny bit about transactional analysis. So I, I don't think we, we probably don't want to bury people necessarily in transactional analysis. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know enough yet. But if, uh, could you like lay a foundation of what is transactional analysis and, and maybe how, yeah. how does it apply like in an everyday situation? So the, in short, what we call is TA for transactional analysis, that is, that is a bigger theory around understanding human psychology and behavior as to why do I act and behave the way I do versus why someone else also acts and behaves the way they do. Inside of this theory, there are many different tools so I think in the book, um, I think I speak to, I think three or four different tools inside of TA mm -hmm. um, out of 12 chapters. So you've got many different things, but it's, it's really understanding how we operate as human beings with the assumption that we have a healthy mind um, and that we are able to think rationally and clearly about things. And so, for example, you've got different ego states around, do I come from, when I speak to my, my team members, do I come from a parent, a child, or, or an adult? And how do I send specific inv invitations? Then there's another, another chapter in there around motivation, like what are the different motivational hungers that makes me tick? Instead of the carrot and stick approach, or just I'm going to pay you more money, or I'm going to give you a more bonus. It's fundamental psychological things that makes us tick. And so. And that many, for, for many counselors and therapists, they use it in, in clinical psychology. And we use it in the workplace because it makes so much sense. Right. Um, and that's why it pops up so much, yeah. Okay. And so you stumbled onto that 2008, you said? Yes. And it's, I mean, it's way older than that. It's oh, when yeah. I, um, <laughs> that's when I did a, a kind of a, just a quick short course and then I fell in love with it. And then I did a, a very long foundational, I think it was a 12 month in depth course and certification where you really dig deep into all of those things, but it's all about how, how you show up and how it affects you. And there's a, I remember just, uh, there was a lot of drama, internal drama going through that whole process. Oh yeah. Because of that, I know exactly how it, how it manifests. And okay. then with experience, you can see how it manifests in teams. I mean, how I see how it manifests in my own team. Even this morning, I saw how it manifests. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it worked out in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally. But, it's, it's, you know, as leaders, we can't always be 100% perfect. We also have our moments. And then you go, okay, backtrack, backtrack. Let me, because it's the awareness and then the practical way of how can I change this? How can I uh, swing this around? Or where do I own up to to that I did something in, a, in the wrong way? Right. Um, and how can I own up to it without making myself small, but still still be respectful to myself and to the team? Right. That's interesting. So in, in that kind of work, um, so I, I, for about, geez, I don't know, five, five, six, ten years maybe, I, I was teaching innovation workshops, uh, which used a, a variation on the kind of idea of, uh, you know, like what, what drives you, are you an, are you uh the 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 sort of dimensions where are you an explorer where you really love to create new ideas and generate I new ideas but you don't necessarily execute them you so you're the idea person and developers on the other side and we would purposely create 
teams that are probably impossible to work <laughs> as the first exercise. And that would, that, and then you throw them into a, a time crunch. Uh, you make them do something with teams that are totally not appropriate for the, for the situation under pressure, people that need time to, to ramp up, freak out people that don't need any time and don't pay attention to directions, jump straight in and fall into the traps that are already built. Do, do, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, it maybe qualifies as torture. I'm not sure. So, <laughs> uh do you do, do things like like if you're teaching people how to use these tools do you need to simulate something like that or is it just clear enough from going through some examples that if you if you've had a conversation like this you're in parent mode and if the other person is not in a receptive mode for the way that you're presenting it this is what can happen just, do you simulate it or do you use examples or some combination so it's a bit of a combination. Um, okay. the, the first thing is really for people to understand the context of the theory, because if you don't understand what the theory is, then it's very difficult to put that into practice. So right. we do a, a bit of an explanation around it. And then depending on what the, what the initiative is about, is it about developing leadership skills? Because then it becomes a little bit of a training process and you're reflecting on how you've been with people and how you, for example, have engaged and you, you look at things, scenarios where things worked well, where it didn't work well, um, even if you have to have a tough conversation, one that you have su supposed to have in the future, and you can start planning for that. The other way that we use this is through team developments. And that is where we can still give the context but then you look, and that's, for example, if a team is really struggling to work well together, then you use that context and you physically bring that into the team where they start having these discussions with one another and you bring up a scenario that where things went wrong and then you start analyzing and then people will speak up and say, well, I must admit when, when, when you said that, I really felt like just wanted to punch you in the face. So my <laughs> rebellious child obviously came out screaming. So that's when you when you start creating these conversations within team developments. And of course, also through different activities, and then you debrief that activity. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've got one where it's like it's we have to get onto a sheet and do certain things. And then afterwards, it's like, why, for example, did you decide to not get involved? And why did you get so involved? And like you you were exhausted at the end of it. it does that really relate back to the workplace? And then people will go, yeah, but she's always the one that does that. <laughs> okay, so where are you the rescuer and where are the, you the persecutor or the oh, yeah. So those kind of things. So it's definitely depends a little bit on what the client needs. Um, but it's, there's a training element to it and then there's the process facilitation to get people to really work well together and using right. that fundamentals or fundamental tool as the way to work through difficult scenarios. Okay. <laughs> And when when people engage you, um, is it? I don't know if there's any consistency. Is it? Are they are they already at what they consider to be high performing, and they're looking for an extra edge, or they or part of the reason I started this podcast and the idea happens very early in the pandemic, and then I got busy creating two companies and didn't run with the idea. But the idea was, you know, who knows what's going to happen next? Nobody was predicting COVID, right? Um, but something happens, you can, there's a lot of companies that said, you know, this will be over in a month or three months or a year or whenever, or deny that it exists at all. And, um, there's a lot of those. I, I interviewed like a hundred people, which for some reason I did not try to put into a book or even a series of articles. Uh, it was just for my own mental state. There's a lot of companies that are gone. Right, because they they didn't do anything to try to adjust. So the reason I call this next feature today is you could create your next feature today, which is why I like to talk to people like you. That look, it, you don't need to like take a, a year long course on transactional analysis to reap the benefits of it. And if you just stay still, any of you know any of your competitors in a period like this who accelerate while you stand still, you have a maybe an insurmountable amount of distance to catch up if you were already lagging them in the first place. So is there any sort of maybe in the last year and a half or so versus earlier in your career, is there any sort of dynamic that's changed? Like has the urgency happened faster or is it larger companies, smaller? Yeah. So I think it's, it's hard to say in terms of larger companies or smaller because um, like we, we, we really focus on, we want to help companies that really struggle um, 
not, I mean, even if they are performing, we can certainly help them, but, and we do, but it is, it's about teams that sometimes struggle to get along. Mm -hmm. Then it's individual team members that are really burnt out and that they, they've, they've lost that kind of sense of, they've, they've lost their mojo. Um, in, in another sense. So, and then right. you've got companies, the bigger companies that come to us and say, we want to increase our, I call it the batting lineup. So they want to increase their leadership pool. So then it's about creating leadership skills for potential future leaders. Um, so it, it really, it varies a little bit in term, from company to company in terms of why they are contacting us. But what has happened with over the past, I think it's been almost like what, nine, 20 months or so, right. is that we find that because of the remote workplace, it's almost like we had to zone in on communication, basic communication skills. Right. Um, and I'm not talking about saying hello and hi, how are you? I'm talking about like, how do I, how do I connect with someone? How do I adapt? How do I understand who they are as a person and not necessarily take offense to how someone is saying something, but rather learn from it, adapt to it and change it and, and be a bit and be more empathetic, how to create a learning organization. So that's kind of a lot of the things that we've been working with. And then obviously um, at, the, at the end of that, or not the end, but supporting that is also working in this whole way of how can I be resilient? How can I, instead of becoming a victim, become more like a creator of what it is that I want to achieve in the environment that I'm in, knowing that certain things is not going to change and I don't have control over it. So it's, right. it's kind of that mindset change um, together with communication skills over the past uh, year, two years. But in general, the, the reason why companies call us or ask us to support and teams ask us to support is very different things. In, if you read the first chapter, it's a little bit around what phase are your team in? Mm -hmm. And we've got many different companies phoning us because they're in different phases of that, of that model, whether they knew it's a new team or the team is storming or the team is in a comfort zone and norming right. or they're in norming, yet this is a big thing that ha happens often is then performing and the leaders are all technical specialists and their kind of next thing in career was to start leading people and then they have no clue how to do that because it's hard it's not a freaking soft skill it's right difficult. yeah yeah it's the hardest and soft then, skill <laughs> yeah and then it's really to support those leaders who actually just want to be a specialist but now how can we help you to make this easier and to and to really lead well so that, right. that's kind of, if, I, if that answers your question in terms of the different spheres of where we, where we sit. Yeah, no, no, I think it makes sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, like, so the, uh, you know, the transactional analysis, the storming, norming, farming, all those things, and the special bonus one that I wasn't aware of. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So actually, and I'm, I'm interviewing a guy next week. Uh, his latest book is called Engineering. Okay. Um, I, which you would probably enjoy <laughs> it's uh i haven't I haven't read it yet because i have until next week before <laughs> before i interview him <laughs> but it's also it's it's a beautifully and there was a book before that so he's talking about how do you it's it's very similar like how do you uh, in a user experience or a customer experience or whatever there's a lot of time thank god finally spent on onboarding and getting people in right yeah which is still frighteningly bad generally and it's harder potentially when it's all remote and I, th I think that's a cop out to to claim that but you know when you're when you're ending a project or a team or a business unit or a product line whatever do you just all right done next <laughs> or do you do something to create an end that makes sense and honors the work that's done and treats you know treats customers who are maybe uh, end of life to need to upgrade into a different product or you know, any of that kind of stuff. There's not a lot of thought put into that or from a sustainability perspective, do you build things so they can be recycled or, you know, reuse in some way that doesn't happen often, often enough either. I mean, we can't solve everything, but you know, at least because part of the reason I got into um, high performance teams, and things, some things that blocked high performance teams to me were that enterprise tech 
technical systems, IT systems were terrible. They were built for geeks by geeks who apparently didn't know normal human beings and didn't realize that they don't want to have to learn how to do an expense report in 10,000 easy clicks. You know? <laughs> so we've addressed that. Well, what about the rest of it? And, you know, and it's sort of that sort of stuff is waved through from the consumer side into new hires, into promotions uh, and things like that. So it's, um, it's it's just it's a it's funny how things sort of spread around as as they've been around because you know a lot again a lot of these things have been concepts that have been around for decades maybe you know coming up on a century soon <laughs> when will we learn <laughs> yeah i guess it's, it's that need for constantly being on trend and in the new and then we forget what works Right. I'm not saying that we shouldn't evolve. Absolutely. I mean, we're constantly also reading about new things and thing, and stuff. But it it is also remembering the stuff that really works and has an impact. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it is very easy to... Uh to sort of chase after the, the new and cool thing, even if it's um, maybe not as baked as it, as it could be. <laughs> and, 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 you know, one, one thing I finally understood, thankfully, not, uh, not too late in my career is that, you know, I, like, I don't know, I don't know about you, but for me and a lot of people that I, that I know, we're very early on trends. I mean, part for me, it's because it's part of my job to help identify and advance for other people before they fall into the landmine that I just stepped in that, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I can, I can tell them to stay away from that, focus on this, uh, and, and give them some warning signs so they don't have to just, just take my, my word for it but there's a lot of in hindsight uh there's a lot of benefit to not being part of that first wave of crazy people <laughs> that, that tackle things you learn from someone else's mistake right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so that's that's why it's normally it's a bell curve distribution sort of right and um but you know, like and where are we that's, that's again where the beauty of mentors come in um mm. Because then you, if you do get a mentor that, that's in the space where you want to learn and things, they, they do share their experiences. And whether you follow, follow the mentor kind of um, advice that was given or suggestions, at least you, you know from someone else's experience what could have happened, what did happen, what they tried, what didn't work. So, yeah, that, that, that for me is a very, very important role is the mentor role. And that's also why this was written is because of, of the, the mentor. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, um, so one of the things that we wrote about in the Gen Z effect is, is the, the kind of the core principle is look, regardless of your age, we're all humans. I hope yeah. there might be aliens among us, but let's assume we're all humans. Uh, and we can all learn from each other. Right. So there's no, you know, just because you've lived to a certain age, means you've experienced more things. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're smarter just because you're older, right? And there's this uh, kind of generational warfare that goes on that you're too old and you're too young and you're, I don't know who you are. You're stuck in the middle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So for, for me, it's Gen X with a classic exactly. middle, middle child. <laughs> um, but one of the ideas that we talked about is, so if you're going to, so there's a lot of myths and, and biases that exist in that sort of realm mentors um to me don't happen often enough in in organizations you know it's you know partly probably because the the the, the people who are potential mentors are already overloaded with all sorts of stuff that they've taken on and probably haven't let go of reverse mentorship though is a way you know if you can't if you don't have the time to keep up on TikTok, for example i don't know that you should but if you wanted to you could turn to your kids who are going to ignore you probably. <laughs> so maybe you need somebody oh, else. Like, seriously, mom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but reverse mentorship, there's, there's, there's plenty of ways to cross pollinate. So I'm, I'm curious from a high performance perspective, does, does the idea of reverse mentorship, has that entered into any of your work or is it, is that like poison? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you what we do. Um, and this is maybe something practical that your listeners can try and implement within their own businesses um, sure. or even with, with a, 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 peer, a peer group is we don't necessarily call it reverse mentorship. We just we set up peer coaching circles. And what we what we try to install within businesses is, first of all, we teach the coaching skills to people. So how can you intern, in, internally in a business use coaching skills? 
to support development and engagement and solution like problem solving but it is really to to create small groups within a business cross functional cross generations where you get together call it on a monthly basis or on a six weekly basis there's a specific agenda that you follow that I've designed but inside of this if you you stay specific or you stay with one specific person around their challenge and then the people who are in your peer circle do experience shares around when they have had a similar scenario and how they dealt with it and what worked what didn't work okay. and then the person who brings the challenge will say that was useful that was useful that was useful and that's what i'm going to try and implement and then the next person goes this comes from a, a methodology that we use in a company called entrepreneurs organization so i'm hmm. part of a i don't know if you if you've heard of eo is what it is in short Mm, okay. And in forums and in an accountability group, the whole thing is around you're not allowed to give advice. You can only do experience shares. Yeah. And that that kind of setup that we now do inside businesses reminds me a lot of what you call the reverse mentoring. Okay. Um, because now the a, a, a older guy can sit with a challenge where they don't know how to speak to one of the one of the one of his team members who's 10 years younger than him or her right. and then the other person who's there might be 20 years younger but they remember a scenario where they didn't work well with someone and then they just share what they've done right so no one is telling you what you have to do or should do it's you choose what about that share do you want to take on mm -hmm. and that is working beautifully so it's yeah maybe maybe some of your listeners can can implement that and try it out it's right I, i've got three different peer groups that i'm that i'm in a part of on a monthly basis just because it's so flipping cool <laughs> <laughs> around the experience shares that you get so yeah right. that, that for me is whether it's reverse mentoring or whether it's peer coaching or peer sharing it's crucial right. there's so much that we can learn from one another based on different personalities and based on different generations. Yes, we get frustrated with different personalities, so we so do we with different generations. Right. But we can learn a hell of a lot from them from each right. other. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that I, I was not expecting that to come up, so that <laughs> that's fun. Um and you know, it, it is uh so uh, have you have found that that sort of that sort of circle approach um is it easier, harder, just just different to do it virtually versus in person? Good question. I think obviously in person for me is always hands down much better. Right. But because the way that we do it, we set it up and we facilitate what like one of our facilitators will facilitate the very first session, whether it's in person or virtually, so that you can get the feel for it. And once people are comfortable, even when once people are comfortable virtually, it's it runs smoothly. The, yeah. the trick is to stick to the time and to not steal someone else's time. Yeah. And that it can really run very smoothly in a virtual environment. And we kind of set that up for the first or two sessions so that people are very comfortable with doing it. Okay. In um, just in my opinion, everything's always better in person, but that's that's my personality. <laughs> uh, yeah, well it's it's funny. So it's um you know, like, I, I don't know, you know, there's all sorts of theories on how long does it take to establish a new habit, right? You know, it's, it's 21 days, for some reason, it's, you know, it's five minutes, it's 10 years, it's, it's, you know, I think it's, it's fairly individual is what it comes down to. Um, but and, you know, changes can happen instantaneously, if uh, in, in lots of different situations. Um, I think so for for the work that I've been doing in the last two years, one of them is a is a product called Plexicam, which is meant to make it so that you can have better eye contact with people, right? Um, and that was not a thing, you know, that was a thing that some people were aware of before the pandemic. Um, and for the first year or so, it was typically only the professionals who they had to make their living because they were coaches or mentors or they did keynotes or whatever, or they did, you know, they were therapists, you know, any number of scenarios. And now, because this has not gone away, it's become much more apparent. I was, I was actually just watching a guy, uh, I think he's on, normally he's a host on CNN, but he has another, he has his own podcast and video um you know vlog and 
on CNN, he looks fantastic because they've got $10 million worth of equipment, you know, 300 people running the show. And then when he's sitting at his desk doing this, doesn't look so great. No, no eye contact. The video quality is not, not great. So it's, it's been interesting to see how people adapt to that because in some ways, like when I was talking to Rich Mulholland, he said, you know, I, I come from a, a rock music background and you know, the, the front row. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's, he's so much fun. Um, the uh, you know, if you, if you've ever paid to have front row seats, which I've never done because it's never seemed worth it to me, you know, the, the only reason those are so valuable is because they're so scarce, but in this kind of world, everybody has a front row. Like we could, you know, whoever's listening could be right here effectively listening to our conversation. And why isn't that better? You know? So he said, so he said, it's a bug, not a feature that front row seat tickets are the best in the house for a live concert. That's terrible. That means, you know, the people that paid less, they still paid money to be there. (laughs) Why are we screwing them? (laughs) And it's the same with, you know, the virtual stuff. So it can be great. Uh, It definitely, it takes different um, t- yeah. different issues. So, so we do a lot of uh, combination, like whether you want to call it hybrid sessions, where some people are in the office and others, the rest of the team is um, online. Just yep. because some people are comfortable to come into the office uh, during the pandemic and others don't feel comfortable or they've got elderly parents that they need to look after, whatever the reason. But we make sure that we set it up in such a way that everyone feels included. And we actually, yeah. before we start, we also, we, you literally show to the person, if you speak, please also use this laptop or use this camera as another person, because that's where you're going to connect with the people um, on screen. And so there's a little bit of just a quick little education thing that happens. And we are very quick to also in a session, we'll go, um, don't like, we'll, we'll say also remember to just look over there and not make a big deal out of it. Yeah. But it's when it's ignored and when you forget about the people online and when you forget to look in the camera and look at yourself to see if your hair is all good, <laughs> <laughs> which often happens, that, that is that's when you do lose that connection. But I, I think. I think sometimes people make a little bit too much of a big deal around it instead of just saying, hey, quickly look in your camera, have a look at me. Just help each other right. to, uh, to, to connect on, on, on the virtual platform or the online platform. As we call it. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, so it's been interesting because I, and I've been in those scenarios where like my, um, my former partner and I, we were two guys in, in the only office in Boston, the, almost the entire rest of the uh, company was down in outside of Washington, DC. And we'd have monthly meetings and they'd be talking about something and they had lunch brought in for everybody there. We couldn't, this is pre video because it wasn't, this was like 2000. 7 2008 so we couldn't see anything it was only over a terrible conference call like a you know some a polycom which hideously yeah. expensive but was still not great and we'd be like hey nobody said lunch was being provided so we're sitting here starving and you keep talking about something that you're apparently passing around the room but we can't see would have been nice if you said that to us so we could know what you're talking about like there's a magazine redesign that they did oh this looks beautiful hey i'm sure it does yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, there's definitely a little bit of an extra um, level of thinking and, in, and consideration that needs to happen when you're working only online or when it's, when it's a hybrid approach that, that you do. And yeah. as a facilitator, I think we're quite sensitive to make sure that, that both parties feel engaged um, and that the, especially the guys on, in the Zoom room or Teams or what it, Google, I don't know, <laughs> I, you know. I, they probably changed it <laughs> today. I don't know. <laughs> that, um, that they feel engaged and that they actually feel that they're also learning during the process and can contribute and not lose their voice because they are online. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, so as as usual, there's so much that we could talk about. I, <laughs> we have somehow almost come to the hour. Um, but that, I take that as a good sign. It's a, you know a, a thriving conversation. This should be the beginning, not the not the end of this. Um, so let's see. So uh, where where are the best places for people to find you? So your, your new book is called Ditch Mediocrity. Yeah. Where's the best um, places to find you? Uh, if you guys are you in the States, um, so it's available on Amazon and then also, of course, on Barnes and Nobles. 
Um, so that's probably the two best ways to get it. I, and I would honestly recommend the hard copy just because you have these little scribbles and things that, yes. um, that makes the hard copy a little bit more um, exciting and sure. you can hear the chicken is coming in th into the book. And then just in terms of where to follow me is LinkedIn is the best um, business platform. It's just Helene Smuts. And then I've got a few other, like the Facebook and Instagram is Helene Talks. Um, okay. But I'm, I'm definitely, I'm very, very active on, on LinkedIn. And um, yeah, the, the company is called Credo Growth. So if you want to check that out, uh, credogrowth.co.za. And yeah, the, the rest is this, this kind of Helene Talks in, in Helene Smuts is kind of what I... What okay. What I <laughs> Yeah, I think when when I search for your name on LinkedIn, I don't. I, there doesn't seem to be other any other Helene Smuts. So that's really. Okay. I don't, I don't okay. think so. Or 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 I'm blind. I mean, that's possible too. Yeah. Or just have a bad memory. <laughs> but it's uh, it's like I have I have a running Google alert on my last name, which is not actually that rare in the in the world of of Danish yeah. people that drop the J from, <laughs> from it. Um, but surprisingly, it's. Um, it usually only picks up me because it's only searching on the last name. I don't know. It's there's something about branding, like you know, you need to. So you, you talked about uh, ditch me out. There's oh, there was one phrase I meant to say. I really loved. Uh, oh, my my notes are just massive. <laughs> oh, marvelosity. Oh, marvel. <laughs> 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 yeah, dude, like from marvelous to marvelous. Mar yeah, marvelous. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's things like that. I mean, that's so. That's another example of why I like talking to authors. If you're yeah. going to make a book at all, it should be memorable. It should be actionable, unless it's non. You know, if it's fiction, then it should do whatever you want it to do. But um, if it's going to be applicable, you need things that are unique because otherwise, our brains constantly like, nope, heard that. I've heard already, <laughs> already heard that. So mediocre, uh, mediocrity and marvelosity. The journey from mediocrity to to um, to marvelosity to marvelous um you know things like that are and maybe it's because you also know rich maholan but you, there's definitely maybe it's a south african thing i don't know but there's a similar vibe between your book and his latest well, one Here he, Be Dragons. he is a mentor of mine so yes. <laughs> so that's probably like his, i have done so much learning in the past kind of two years having conversations with with rich maholland um okay. It's also been my coach and my mentor to become a, a, a global keynote speaker. So I've got a, I've got a lot of things. And I actually, I think I do even say thank you to him in the book. If I'm, yeah. Yep. It's, the last one, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, no, there's definitely a lot of, and especially me stepping into my own cheekiness and how I say things, it's to find that confidence. And so, yeah, he's, he's got a big part in my development. Absolutely. Fantastic. So I, before we wrap up here, so I'd like to say, so the concept is next feature today. If there was one thing that people are going to do right now that would help them get on the path to higher performance for themselves or the teams right now and make a difference by tomorrow, what's, what's one thing that you would recommend? Well, first read the book. <laughs> no, I'm being cheeky. Um, <laughs> Sure, that is, it's very, very difficult to, to put it into one thing. Um, I think the first thing that pops to mind for me is to start having open conversations um, and be open to listen to your team and not necessarily just from a being a bulldozed and just saying yes to everything that your team has to offer. Mm -hmm. But Patrick Vincioni, he speaks about passionate discussions. Um, it's allowing those those tough conversations, passionate conversations to come into the room and not and for you as the leader not to dictate that room. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the, the, the big the biggest thing for me. And it's also the thing that I struggle with the most. Because yeah. I'm a I'm 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 loud. I'm I'm I've got lots to say. Right, yeah. <laughs> and we often because of how we are I'm not saying every and everyone is like this, but don't lose your team's voice. Mm. Because the moment you lose the team's voice, that is when when you really need to start working on the communication things and you lose creativity, you lose innovation. Um, so that would be my main thing is create a space where these passionate debates and, and crucial, tough, yet respectful conversations can happen. There you go. Yeah, we'll tackle the, the hard stuff first is, is what that translates into. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
But there, there was a, I always show one of these videos. Um, Brene Brown is interviewed by, oof, I can't even remember who she's interviewed by. And she says, don't, the whole thing around vulnerability for her is don't tap out, lean in. Mm -hmm. And I love that saying, don't tap out of a conversation. Don't tap, tap out when it's uncomfortable, lean into it. Right. Uh, I think that for high performance, if you can lean into that uncomfortableness and still come out together with your team with solutions, great. Yeah. She, she is just insanely good. <laughs> Amazing. She's, she's incredible. She's not from the 50s, I know, but she's yeah. still there. <laughs> yeah. No, it just seems I, I don't know if it's uh, I, I don't know enough about her to know if it's if she's always been like so at ease with like the way that she presents Look, and the material I, her, her depth of knowledge is just crazy I, I just think her experience is like the way that she is and why she is is because of experience and also because she's got got it wrong so many times in with her own team and with herself yeah. um, so, and I, I think that's where you can see the authenticity from yes from the i've almost said a very bad swear word <laughs> goodness i messed up oh my god i'm sorry yeah oh there my dad you go i swear like a sailor okay uh, <laughs> yeah well hey why not well we started we started it off laughing we can end it laughing Helene, thank you so much for, for joining me. I'm so glad that, that Rich introduced us. And um, there's, I, I, I think we'll be talking again. There's there's plenty of other <laughs> things that we can dive into. Yeah, we, can do 12, we can do 12 different podcasts with her. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but awesome. amazing. Thanks for having me. And I really hope um, you enjoy the rest of your day and also um, your month ahead and the new year. Started. Yes, yeah. you too. Yeah, no pleasure. Pleasure talking to you. Good luck with with the book. I know it's still early days uh, having it out there, and um, you know it's definitely a slog, but it's it's it is one of the most worthwhile journeys that I've ever personally yeah. taken. And um, you know, it, it brought us together. So hopefully, that's uh, just one little piece on on top of your cake. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and and it's been very well received, and the feedback so far has also been incredible. So it's given me like that feeling of damn, this is the right thing that you have done. So yeah, yeah. Very and very awesome. happy to have you. Yeah, awesome. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Dan. Keep well. Cheers. Bye.